Friends, hello, welcome to Peace Building 101, the search for common ground. My name is Maritza Mejia and I serve as development director with Search for Common Ground. And I'm delighted that you're here. At the outset, I wanna acknowledge that this is for many of us, a very somber week. Parts of the US are still reeling from unprecedented hurricane damage. And with, there's another storm that's due to set in just today. War continues to surge across several, several parts of the Middle East and elsewhere. And some days it feels like our calendars are punctuated by violence. If you're showing up today feeling despair, sensing grief, I want you to know that you're not alone. We hold it with you. We hold it together, which in fact is the only way that we can do this kind of work. We're committed to peace building, not merely as individuals, but as a collective, a community of people rooted in the conviction that another way is possible and we are resolved to make it so. This seems to me the only place that we can start a Peace Building 101 session. So thank you for being here today. Today, you're gonna to hear from two of my colleagues who will help to guide all of Search's work across 36 countries. They will share with us what peace building really means and what it looks like in these diverse contexts. And we'll be inspired to consider what finding common ground in our own contexts might look like. First, I'm honored to introduce you to Michael Shipler. Michael is Search's VP of Strategy, as well as the interim CEO of Celia, a global leader in virtual dialogue and exchange. Michael has over 20 years of experience in the field. He has designed, managed, and scaled up effective and innovative programs that address complex and sensitive issues in conflict-afflicted countries. He holds an MA in War in the Modern World from King's College in London and a Certificate in Disruptive Strategy from Harvard Business School Online. He's held multiple roles at Search, including Asia Regional Director, where he held programming in 11 countries. He has been our Director of Programs in Nepal and is the founder of Search's Children and Youth Division, establishing core methodology for youth and peacebuilding work. He co-founded the Washington Network on Children and Armed Con Conflict and helped found the Child Soldiers Initiative, a global project aimed at eradicating the use of children as soldiers. So thank you for being here, Michael. Excited to hear from you. And up next, I want to introduce Adrian Lemon. Adrian is Search's Senior Director of Strategy. She holds a doctorate in sociology from Boston University and is the creator of the Peace Impact Framework, an overarching structure for measuring and understanding peace. You're going to hear a lot more about that today. She also oversees Connexus, which is a global learning platform on peace with members from 190 countries. After working in health and education sectors in the United States, Adrienne moved to Burundi, where her doctoral research focused on the connections between identity, narratives, and forms of collective action during the Civil War. She served as a research and program consultant on violence in justice, health, media, economic development, mining, and tech sectors. Adrian joined Search in 2013 as a learning specialist supporting teams in East, Southern, and Central Africa, as well as in Israel and Palestine. And she became Global Director of Learning in 2017. In all of her work, she remains committed to learning approaches that shed light on the lived experiences of people in conflict in real time, such as the conflict scan, conflict pulse, and grounded accountability model. Michael and Adrian, thank you so much for being here. Um, before I ask you a few questions, I would like to just remind those of us joining today that you are welcome to submit your own questions for Michael and Adrian. They truly are global experts. They're experts in this field. Um, and so I know uh, this, this could be a valuable time to just get to know them and hearing more from them. You'll be able to use the Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And as you submit them throughout the event and towards the end of our time together, we're going to take some uh, time to address them and respond. And if we're not able to respond during this time together, we are committed to responding to you one on one. So please do submit your questions. All right. So, Michael, we're going to start with you. Today's event uh, has been billed as Peace Building 101. So I want to begin with a simple but essential question. How does search define peace building? Thank you, Maritza. And firstly, I just want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, I, I really recognize that all of us are living in a time and moment where things feel so perilous and the conflicts uh, that are surround us feel at our door or in our door in our lives. Um, and so the commitment to trying to transform those conflicts feels like uh, the call of our time. 
Uh, and I just really want to recognize you for taking the time in the middle of your day to come here and have this conversation. Really looking forward to, to all of this. For us, you know, peace building, it's really any effort, whether it's large or small, to transform a conflict uh, so that the differences that exist in our societies, either in our lives or in our societies as a whole, uh, the competing interests, the power differences, they don't become actually a key driver of violence, but actually become key drivers of progress. Uh, there is, you know, we, people often ask me, like, well, who is a peace builder? And it's true that peace building is a sector. It's a professional sector. Search for Common Ground is an organization talks about itself as we're the world's you know, largest peace building organization. And yes, there's techniques and methodologies, and that's true, uh, and refined techniques um, and, and things that we've learned over you know, decades and decades of, of practical experience and deep scholarship and research that have told us how conflicts can transform. And at the same time, while it's a professional sector, actually everyone should be and could be a peace builder. Why? Because each of us actually live with conflict in our lives, whether it's in our own families, our communities, our societies, we're interacting with people constantly on a day-to-day -day basis who have differences, differences of opinion, differences of identity, differences of interests, with whom we can actually reach out and build, uh, build relationships. Um, and so very often when we talk about this, we talk about how so much of our work is about working with people, uh, no matter where they sit in their societies, to help them use their power to transform the conflicts uh, away from adversarial conflicts that cause destruction toward ones which are really truly collaborative. Um, and the thing I would say is that in the world more and more, I think we're feeling like we all live in a conflict zone. And while not every conflict zone that each of us lives in is suffering from acute violence and acute displacement or destruction on a wholesale scale that we're seeing in some places. Actually, all of us are having the conflicts and the divisions, the polarization of our societies land in our own, you know, in our own hands at times, on the phone, in our own families, in our own uh, environments. And so the call to actually step up and to say, okay, well, I'm going to actually take take the courage to build relationships across divides. That's a call that actually is for all of us. Uh, and so we all have a role to play. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> you know, it, my job is to make connections between our community and our work. And so I hear from folks all the time how they respond to the answer that you just gave and, and to Search's approach in general. And, you know, one thing that's on my mind is when we see that parties are at odds with one another, um, you know, it's it's easy to encourage people to find with people with opposing viewpoints to encourage them to find common ground. But my sense is that for for so many, um, this just remains an, an aspirational thought. I, it's it's so difficult to know how to actually go about doing that. So if you could share with us, you know, how does search help people to find that common ground? What is our staff's role in that process? What you know? What are the role of the people who are from the conflicting parties? How, did, how does it come together? About a year and a bit ago, uh, I had the opportunity to visit Kabul uh, and to sit with uh, our team in Afghanistan. And you know, this was almost exactly seventeen months uh, after the Taliban took over the country. Um, you know, many organizations, international organizations had to withdraw uh, at that time. And our staff uh, really asked us and said clearly, we have a role to play. Uh, yes, there are a million Afghans leaving as refugees. Uh, there are 44 million who are staying here. Um, and they really guided us saying that there's actually in some ways more opportunity and space to try to build peace now as there's a little bit of security and ability to move around after the Taliban took over. Um, and yet it's been, a, you know, one of the most challenging and complex contexts and environments in the world for us to work. Our director is an Afghan woman uh, who negotiates uh, with the, you know, what they call the de facto authorities for our space to be able to work and has been able to do that. And in that environment, you know, we had to ask this question, how do we actually build peace in an environment like that, where people are under such pressure, uh, where women's rights are being, you know, not just eroded, but stripped away. Um, and so we started with civil society, with organizations, 
regular people who are trying to organize things in their own communities, try to address their basic needs. Not all of them are doing political work. They might be doing humanitarian work, et cetera. And we brought a whole group of them together, um, over 150, and, and brought them together and said, well, how are we going to work in this environment? About 25 or 30% of those organizations were led by women. And I sat with a group of the, of the women who were leading those organizations, five of them. And I asked the question, how do you work with the Taliban? And how do you work in the Taliban space? I got a lot of fascinating answers. Um, but the most important one, and, and, and I'm happy to share in depth on this, but the most important one for me was that uh, one woman said, we start with each of the Taliban members as people, as human beings. And we seek to relate to them and connect to them as human beings. And we recognize their fathers, their brothers, their sons, their, you know, they have aspirations, they have complex lives, and that they actually have jobs to do now. And we're able to just use that as an origin point to actually start to open up space to actually identify not just their common humanity, which is trite in some ways, um, but actually to open up and identify what are the core common interests that they have, where actually, if, you know, they, they actually find ways to at least get out of each other's way, if not work together, they could address some of the core basic needs uh, of their communities. And for me, this was astounding, because they were applying what we call in our core approach, the common ground approach, which is this core idea that if we can work together across divides around our shared interests, we can generate really powerful, uh, enduring and lasting solutions to the conflicts that uh, that divide us and to the core problems that we face. So our, our core insight, I think, as an organization is that is that you know, most of the problems we face as humanity, whether at the community level, whether you're dealing with, I don't know, you know, water sanitation all the way to climate change, most of those critical problems are resolvable. What's blocking us is our lack of ability to collaborate. And so, uh, and so what we do with our work is to really look for ways to bring people and groups and institutions across those divides to come to really understand each other, to see each other, to really find ways that they can actually work collaboratively to address those critical problems. We also work in the broader environment that people operate to make it feasible and possible for them to do that. Um, and so that's really our, our central point. Our, our starting point is a concept we call, we talk about it search a lot, we call it multi-partiality. It's this core organizing premise for us um, in that we bring together teams, we are teams, of people who are working across the critical and divides that are dividing a society. Meaning that, yes, we put a premium on diversity because we understand that having diverse teams uh, enables us to have better performance, that's understood. But our diversity is also really specifically about saying that we need to deal with and grapple with the conflict dynamics of the society inside our own teams and actually deal with those differences in a way that actually transcends those conflicts. Um, Gandhi applied this principle in organizing the Quit India movement. He called, talked about the storm inside and the storm outside. You know, that actually in order to be able to have a significant and powerful effect on the society that's transformative, that enrolls all different kinds of folks to deal with the really critical things that are happening, we need to grapple with those same things inside. And so we start with that concept and we organize from that place and we build out and then work toward fostering collaboration both by modeling it, but actually working with engaging those critical actors in a given society and enabling them to actually work together. Thank you. That's, it, it's so helpful to hear some of those um, pieces that maybe we, we might have inclination about, but but to really hear how they're you know formed in a, in a strategic way. Um, I think that you know one of the pieces that you just spoke to is that those critical actors and the, the people who are actually participating in, in all of the, the work that you just named, um, as our teams are helping to design that process in any particular country or region, how do I, we identify who and determine who is going to be a part of that process and, and around that table? Yeah, one of the things that I often talk about with our teams 
and with others is I, I often say that, you know, the people who need to build peace are the people who need to be involved in building peace. And so while, you know, one of the sets of groups of folks that we work with all the time is, are those who are, you know, already uh, organizing and trying to do this kind of work, this kind of peace building work and, you know, building bridges across divides. And we try to elevate them, their influence and build their skills out. We also really work very closely with and seek to work with those who are directly involved in conflict. And the way that we go about this, we recognize that that means for us to do that, that we have to engage with and involve people who have been involved in violence uh, or have been um, or part of institutions, the organizations that are, are involved in violence, advocating violence, using adversarial approaches. And so the way we go about that, we recognize that uh, people can change. We start with that core premise. Um, people can change, institutions can change. The use of violence, the use of, you know, abhorrent violence is a choice that people have made to actually respond to the conflict and that they can make different choices and they can actually be transformed. And within any given institution, you know, we, we identify what we call champions. I, I have yet in 20 something years of doing this work, uh, I have yet to find an institution where we can't find somebody who within who wants to actually cause change, who has a natural inclination to build bridges across divides, to seek to cause you know, a shift in the conflict dynamics, um, and who is looking for an opportunity to actually do that. And this is true whether we're engaging a police force, a military force, a non-state armed actor, a political party, uh, we find those folks. And we really seek to just de-isolate them and create opportunities for them to find each other across those divides and to build their influence over their own institutions and on the conflict system. So for example, uh, one, one example I love to give is uh, about our work in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a, a place that has suffered from um, several different waves of violent conflict over the decades. Um, and it has included some which, which have had really significant human rights abuses committed by security forces, uh, including the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. Uh, this uh, is something that has tremendous, complete and devastating effects on communities, on, on our people, particularly who, who are survivors of such sexual violence. Uh, what we did was we identified a number of senior officers within the Congolese military who also saw this as abhorrent, both that it was abhorrent because it's a violation of, uh, of human rights, a violation of humanitarian law, uh, but also you know, undermining the interests of their own institution uh, as a military. And we're able to work with them to build out something that was really rooted within the military institution, which was a full, you know, pretty comprehensive training approach to working with frontline soldiers uh, around the prevention of sexual violence. And it was not like a didactic approach where we were seeking to really like train people in, you know, international humanitarian law and say this is wrong, but really actually a transformative approach that was about helping people who are in the military to align their values to the to, to their actions and to their institutions. And we saw a really significant decrease in, uh, in sexual violence in the places where we were able to do that work. It started with people who were champions and champions of a vision, de-isolating them and creating opportunities for them to become peace builders from where they stood. Thank you. That, that's a powerful example where I think we can really understand the, the critical need to have the change come from within and the, you know, the, constituents uh, who have real um, ability to make change around the table. Um, and I wanna to turn to Adrian. Adrian and Michael both are incredible witnesses and, and um, researchers of our work and, and have uh, you know, really seen so many pieces of uh, the process in many different shapes and forms. And so I wanna to, I want to draw on Adrian's experience here. Um, you know, as we heard Michael talking about coming together around this shared table. Um, for those of us who haven't been <clears throat> in a process like this, it can sound virtuous and idyllic. Um, and, and, but in, in reality, uh, I know that you you have seen the, the truth to be that it's it can be an enormously challenging feat for many different reasons, even just to bring people to that table. In your experience, what are some of the barriers that people might face in even getting to that table to be part of the process and, and what challenges do they experience once they're actually in that process and working together? 
Um, thanks, Maritza, and thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. It's great to be here today. Um, around barriers, they they really go from the most basic um, things that often I think people really forget about things like um, physical disability, which may actually keep somebody from getting into a room, um, uh, or even just a physical physical separation. So, you know, this idea of getting groups from opposing sides together when sometimes they physically can't actually meet, um, you know, then then that requires a bit of a pivot. Um, but then it goes up, you know, the, the barriers become more and more complex. We also have things like, um, like traumatic uh, or emotional barriers that people face. Um, and that are quite real and central to the dynamics of a conflict. Um, so if you think about any conflict in the world, a really large part of it is, do people believe that this is the only way <laughs> or do they not? And so that being a barrier is something incredibly important to engage with um, and something real. We also have things like economic barriers. Um, oftentimes, you know, what we see in this work and while we see in the work, not just in peace building, but in tons of types of, uh, you know, interventions around, around conflicts around the world, is that people will think about a really great way to bring a group of people services or to um, have their voice heard. And the only people who can get there are a group of people who have uh, the ability for, to, to afford transport or who are not taking, taking care of children during the day. <laughs> Uh, or, and you can kind of imagine the list uh, of things of things there. Um, and then there are things like personal red lines, um, that sense of, am I giving up my dignity uh, by entering that room? Am I going to be safe if I enter that room? And how will other people see me in my community if I enter that room and come back out? Um, Michael talked about de-isolation. And I think that's one of the most effective tools uh, in uh, in war and conflict is to make people feel like if you don't do what we're saying to do, <laughs> then you aren't part of this group. Um, because it really closes the door uh, on other poss possibilities. So, so those are kind of some of the different barriers that I, a lot of, a lot of um, the teams at search face. And I think peace builders in general do face. And it really goes from everything from a kind of basic physical um, considerations to all the way to uh, much, you know, kind of, I don't want to call them higher level, but yeah, a different type of barrier, which is, you know, will I be safe? Will I be secure? Who am I when I walk in and when I walk out of that room? Um, and some of the challenges that we faced around that, I, I think, you know, this work is really a constant negotiation. So it's, um, you can even plan, you can make a really great plan around all of the conflict dynamics, all of the variables that need to be considered, and they can change uh, two days from now um, with no notice, right? And so um, one of the things that we do in this work is kind of constantly think about what are the barriers and how do we overcome them? How do we create a space that people can come to um, where they feel that their dignity is upheld, where they feel they do not have to sacrifice their principles, and where they feel that there's something productive happening, um, that there is a kind of stand that they can take. And uh, and the creation of that is really, it, yeah, it's really quite a process um, and not just looking at what are the drivers of the conflict or what's the history of the conflict, but also, how are things changing? What are the core opportunities that we can that we can look at right now? Um, who's been left out for a really long time <laughs> from that room and might be interested in walking into it? Um, and how and and really also looking at what they might be interested in doing or discussing once they get there. Uh, so so there's a lot of um, there are a lot of different aspects that really bring this together. And one of one of the you know, I've talked about this before with humor, it's I know, but just one of the things is that we, we often talk about getting people into a room, but um, that it's not actually always a room. And um, we're not always asking people to come sit together. 
And, and that's actually an important part of this. It's a really important part of, of deciding how you create a process. So in, um, in South Sudan, for example, we actually launched a radio show uh, after, in 2014. And the radio show was about creating space for young people to be heard, young people being the primary, primary actors, um, you know, when you look at who are the, who are the people enacting violence, this, this cohort was really the group that was overrepresented in their population. They were sort of really, um, everybody pointed to young people. And yet what we realized was most of them had never even had the chance to hear a person from another tribe or ethnic group that they were constantly fighting against. Um, they'd never heard their perspectives. They actually shared a lot of huge concerns around security uh, and, and other issues and the manipulation of, um, of power dynamics that was going on for both groups or for many, it's actually multi-dimensional. So for all of those groups, and that's something that, um, you know, in that in that case, we didn't create one room. We created a, a virtual space with a whole myriad of discussions taking place where people could opt in or opt out, um, but hear each other for the first time ever. Most people were hearing each other for the first time ever. So kind of understanding that that process is incremental and it doesn't always look like walking into a room and, and shaking hands. Yeah, thank you. That I really love how we're starting to really paint a picture of, of the many ways that this takes shape and, and some of the nuance there that when you say, oh, I, I work with a peace building organization, or I know about this peace building organization that I support, um, you know, it's, 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 this is coming into a fuller detail and, and understanding. So I want to ask another question uh, related to what you just shared uh, and, and the way that people come together. I'm imagining that in in so many of the places where we have peace building processes underway, there are conflicting parties who are now sitting around a figurative or literal table doing this, embarking on this work together. And there may be a significant power differential between those two parties, or perhaps as is you know the case that you just noted, there might be a long history of violence between these two groups um, or, or repression of other forms. In those cases, um, when there is that sort of uh, a history to overcome, how do our teams seek to build peace in ways that don't continue to perpetuate the injustice or the, the power differential? So I think it starts with diagnosis, I would call it. Um, you know, this word power, I mean, I think about I think about it a lot. People with a lot of power put a lot of time and resources into thinking about how to keep conflicts going. Um, it actually takes a huge amount of resources and time and effort to keep people uh, fighting um, and to keep violence going. And so when we think about flipping that and saying, okay, let's challenge those power dynamics, let's disrupt those power dynamics, um, there are three ways that I've seen teams look at this. First is that we often think of, we think of a conflict and we think of group A, group B, maybe group C or D, but we're thinking of it between <clears throat> these different groups. And we often forget about the internal power dynamics of each of those groups. So none of these groups are homogenous. Uh, Michael pointed this out, right? That, you know, ev there's always a group of people who are looking to change, who are saying, wow, something is incredibly wrong here. Um, and I would say there's an even larger group of people who say, wow, it's wrong. I just don't know what to do. And I need to stay, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to stick with my group. Um, so we often kind of have, we, when you think of it, it's it's between groups, but we also have to consider power within groups. Then we also look at this power between what are the dynamics uh, and how does that shape how people can or should or may be ready to interact or may not be um, and what issues they may be ready to address or not. And then I think there's a third piece, which is like the external power dynamics. OK, we're looking at these groups in conflict, but what outside is also creating pressure? Um, maybe it's businesses, maybe it's who knows what? Um, 
and, and what are the dynamics outside that also hold power <laughs> that we need to be thinking about? And so what I see is, is teams who, you know, when they're, first of all, they practice empathy on a level that I think is, um, it's a discipline. It's not just a, a, a moral, you know, nice thing to have. It's a necessity in this type of work to be able to really understand all three sets of those dynamics. Um, and they do that by and by really committing to having a diversity of people in our own teams uh, to make sure we're always keeping each other in check and understanding the perspectives and understanding what it is that we're trying to do. The second thing is where they look for opportunities. Um, so you will see often that one of the things we have to do is come to a decision on what we stand for. And that decision, uh, what I think is really powerful about it is it refocuses the discussion, not on who we stand for, but what we stand for. If it's done really well, it can, it can actually break those barriers down it can challenge power dynamics quite powerfully. Um, one of the exam examples of this I saw was in Sudan. They did work over years and years with women. Um, they worked with lots of different groups in, in Sudan, but in South Kordofan, they were working so heavily with women who had seen, you know, sort of everything upended by, by violence um, and, and everything about their reality upended by violence. And they were able to bring women together on this experience. They were able to identify that women, no matter which side they were on, had been, had been just so incredibly impacted by the violence that, and not really given a space to address or deal with it. Um, and, that, and so they were also able to change some of these power dynamics by, by working with women. And then they were able over years to actually flip those power dynamics. So we saw many of those same women be part of the writing of uh, law that protected women in, in Sudan uh, and also part of the 2019, uh, really like two thirds, I think the, the effort, um, the social movement that overthrew al-Bashir at the time was two thirds women, right? So it was really unprecedented. And so you start to see this movement that builds and builds. Um, and now, of course, we're facing incredible challenges in Sudan, but some of those same women and some new ones were actually still able to come to a table, a real table, um, and, and talk about and, and influence the peace process that was happening in August this year. So that, that work, if it's done right, it never stops, no matter what the challenge is. And I think that can be really important and powerful. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, this is tangential, but related, um, you know, I, I don't know if everyone on this call knows that around the world in the 36 countries where we're, we're actively at work, those teams are 90% of them are, are from that particular country and region. And so that long-term investment is baked in, you know, the people around the table aren't just there for a season. This is their community. This is where their network, their families have roots and want to continue to be. And so when you're talking about that long-term game and the ability to have the same peace builders engaged now, engaged 20 years from now, engaged 40 years from now, maybe even their, their um, family members and children taking on that legacy, um, that's, uh, I think, a, a really important part of the picture that the commitment level is so strong, you know, for these peace builders to find peace because it's their livelihood and it's their children and their grandchildren's livelihood. Um, so I, I thank you for, for everything you just shared. It starts to really come together in a whole picture. Um, okay. So I want to turn to Michael and Michael, not to, not to out your age here, but you've witnessed such searches work for 22 years. Um, I'd love for you to share with us a few examples of how you've seen the common ground approach come together uh, to build peace in various contexts. And just as a you know reminder to the audience, everything we've been talking about today is that common ground approach. Um, and so, yeah, from your experience, what stands out? Thanks. Um, I've been here 22 years, but I started very young. So 
uh, I, I started at search uh, as a 24 year old uh, working on on youth issues and you know one of the core things that has insights that driven the organization for so long is that uh, that young people have a really critical role to play in building peace that no major no major leap and then social justice and the transformation of conflict anywhere in the world has happened without the critical involvement of youth. Uh, and what one of the things that we, you know, as a kind of way that we go about working with youth and, and all stakeholder groups that we, we work with, we take a transformative approach, meaning that we really, you know, rely on, on creating experiences for people that helps really transform not only how they perceive and see the conflict that they're uh, surrounded by, but how they interact with it. And, you know, in this world, we can often cause, you know, in a way, a glancing blow on somebody's trajectory. You know, I talk about this sometimes as the five degree shift principle, you know, that it's it's not a 180 degree change in somebody's life trajectory. You know, all the things, all the assets, the tools that they might bring to one one facet of their life that they might be, you know, driving into to violence could also be mobilized and used to, to drive their contribution to peace. Uh, at the end of the war in Nepal, uh, Nepal had a civil war uh, through the 90s and early 2000s, one that mobilized over 11,000 children as child soldiers uh, who were fighting. Um, at the end of that war, all those children were were leaving uh, or were you know still being held by the the Maoists, which was the insurgent group. Um, and there was you know a negotiation process to bring the conflict to an end. And the fate of these kids was really up in the air. And uh, and the communities were really scared of whether or not they should come home or not. And so we looked at this and we said, well, you know, these kids, fair or unfair, they're actually the vanguard of a reconciliation effort for this country that has suffered in so much. And for each of the communities, which have had so much violence and human rights abuses, abuses they're going to be the first ones coming home at the end of this conflict. How do we actually equip them to come home? How do we help communities to be able to receive them home? Uh, and so we used media. Adrian spoke a bit about our media work that we've been doing in, in various places around the world. And we ran a whole comprehensive set of, uh, of programming. Um, and one of the most wonderful examples uh, of this was uh, an initiative that we ran where we used a very local musical tradition called Dori which is, um, it's, a, it's a kind of improvisational duet kind of music where uh, where the performers, you know, basically interact with the audience. And usually it's used for flirtation. So it's like, you know, the men and women split on one side or the other and they ask, you know, what, you know, they, they sort of do flirtation songs, you know, what star fell from the sky to fall in your eyes type type songs and and it's so powerful that people actually get engaged sometimes during these these uh these dodi parties one of our colleagues said you know could we use this to help actually create reintegration of ex-combatants and so this seemed like a really brilliant idea and so we brought together a whole slew of local professional dodi singers a whole slew of youth leaders who are working in their communities to address different community dynamics um, and a whole slew of child protection experts, people who are really running the reintegration of, of ex-child soldiers. And we were like, what, what can we do? Could we actually bring these together? What resulted with this, this series of festivals that we did in communities? And there were huge, thousands of people came, people who would travel from all over. And in each festival, we would use this music, but instead of men and women and having it be about flirtation, we did an intergenerational approach where we had young people and elders singing to each other. And we had ex-combatants up on stage along with other young people who hadn't had the, hadn't been forced to fight singing together. And, you know, and they would address the mistrust and the, the kids would sing, why should I come home? What are you going to do to me when I get there? And the elders would sing, well, why should we take you back? You yourself have, you know, what have you been involved in? What did you do while you were off in the war? And they would go back and forth and people would listen and sing and dance and and they would come to a point of reconciliation. Okay, my son, you can come home. My daughter, you can come home. Okay, I'll come. And people would weep, like it, weep in the communities. And this was broadcast on local radio. We made cassette tapes. Soon it was like these cassette tapes of these songs were on every bus in the country accompanying that process. And at the end, we could see that there had been a real transformation where 
where there had been so much distrust, so much fear of these kids coming back, and these kids were terrified to come back, they were able to. Um, and we were able to reintegrate. And in fact, it's really a successful piece of Nepal's overarching transformation uh, away from war to peace. Uh, we've really learned that that dialogue is important, but it's insufficient. Um, dialogue is necessary, actually, but it's insufficient. You know, we, you often hear people say, oh, we just need to speak. If we can just talk to one another. You know, in, in the United States, most murders are committed between people who know each other. And so violence is often very intimate and people really know each other. What we really need to be driving is collaboration. You know, and that story is an example of where a whole group of people came together and collaborated. And we have others. I, I can give another example if I have a moment. Should I give one more? Or should I stop there? Yeah, maybe let's I'll just, uh, okay. yeah, we've got, I really want to make sure we leave time for the Q&A. Okay, great. Um, but thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Maybe it'll come up. Um, all right, we're going to do one more question before we turn to the Q&A. Um, and so this, this one is for Adrian. Um, I, I, you know, and, and so one last call for folks to submit their questions in the Q and A box, if you have not yet. Um, but Adrian, so at the start of our time together, we talked about the definition of peace building. And I think so often when I talk to people who are, are learning about what we do, it's easy to think that this is just sort of anecdotal or, you know, subjective impact. But there's real science here and, and there's real measurable outcomes. Um, and so I, I'd love to hear from you more fully about how we define success, how we measure success, how we know that it's working. Sure. And I I think this is a really important piece of this. It's it's like you said, it's really easy to just assume this is about, you know, one person's story of transformation or one person choosing peace. Uh, what does that even mean? It means different things to different people. And so at Search, uh, we we really decided to get quite serious about this. Uh, when I joined, the organization was extremely committed to learning and, and really wanted to, to invest in this. And as it's evolved, we've actually identified some things that are common across all of these different countries and conflicts and contexts. Things that are needed in order for us to see real signs of societal change. So um, there are five, five elements, sometimes we call them five vital signs, and you can think about it the way you would when you walk into a doctor's office. <laughs> you know, there are certain things that you sort of know um, are part of your health, and there are cer certain things we know are part of peace. And so that's, you know, reducing violence, uh, improving personal agency, for people of from all backgrounds uh, and and all you know diverse aspects of a of a context and conflict, uh, reducing pol polarization between groups, and by that I just want to be clear: we really mean whether people can kind of share a social contract or whether they feel they can live to with one another, not necessarily whether they like each other. So there's a really a specific element around that. Uh, improving legitimacy of institutions, and uh, that's based on people's perception, not just making sure institutions are well regarded, but really understanding are institutions serving people, do they represent people, and then looking at the investments and where they're going. Um, oftentimes, you can tell a lot about a conflict, understanding, you know, what money is behind it, and so we also look at that, and what is ready to, to support peace as well. Um, so we we look at these sort of five elements, and when we see those things getting better, we we learn a lot. You know, we learn a lot about uh, about what is actually you know sort of opening up those possibilities and and creating lasting impact. Uh, and when we see one of those things getting much worse, it's often a sign that even if it doesn't look like it on the surface, something is about to go very wrong. And so this is really a, a an important diagnostic tool for us. Um, and it's also a way that we've able we've been able to understand our impact in a lot of cases uh, by you know actually being able to trace those decisions that get people into a room to the decisions that come out of that room to uh, how that then actually does have an effect or not on a community or on a broader society. So that's that's really how we look at it. And I try to I mean I think not just me but a lot of our teams really try to hold us to that because. 
uh, it's easy to have good intentions go wrong. And so, you know, we don't want this just to be a nice process. We want it to be something that actually has that lasting impact. Um, and so that's how we look at it. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, uh, you know, th these measurable outcomes, this is our one of, to me, one of the most powerful things that search does. This is a, a contribution of 40 years of learning coming together to, to form these metrics in this really clear um, analytical way of looking at how to prevent and how to address violence in, in communities. And so I, I absolutely am so grateful to know that search is doing this work on behalf of the entire global community and um, you know, in, in contribution to the entire sector of peace building. Um, and so um, maybe we can actually share a link um, not to put our, our behind the scenes people on the spot, but we have some really beautiful websites dedicated to those outcomes on the common ground approach that we can share if anyone is interested in sort of looking a little bit more deeply into those metrics. Um, we're gonna turn now to the audience questions. Um, and there's some really interesting ones here about polarization in the United States. Um, we might be able to get into that. Um, and then also just what we can do at home to address. Um, but I wanna start with two people submitted an official request, Jenna, Jenna and, and Gilda, Offic uh, official request to hear Michael's second story. So if you could share what that other, that other example was, they would love to hear that. Uh, this was uh, you know, at the end of the war in Sierra Leone. Um, Sierra Leone had a, had a very, very brutal war um, with, with really significant atrocities. And at the end of the war, you know, there were, there were, tens of thousands of former combatants who needed to come home. And there were such mistrust, even many combatants didn't even believe that the war was over, were unwilling to give up their weapons. And so society was really in chaos. And so what Search decided to do is to bring together, to create a radio show called Throw Away the Gun. And the intention of it initially was, well, let's, let's, let's inform folks, like, how do you get home? How do you get, you know, enter the demobilization program, reintegrate, and inform folks, say, how do we welcome soldiers home? How do we humanize people who'd been involved in such atrocities back? And in order to do this, we hired two um, key hosts of a radio show. One was a, uh, one was a former commander of the uh, rebel force, the RUF, and the other a pro-government militia leader, Fode and Rashad. And they ran the show. And for people who listened, it was mind-blowing. They said, wow, if these two commanders who were enemies could be on the radio together in the same studio, maybe the war is really over. I had dinner with them. And uh, one day Rashad, we, we had dinner and Rashad leaned over and put his hand on Fode's shoulder. He said, Michael, you know this guy? You know he tortured me? And they roared with laughter. And there were a couple of us there like, oh. And Fode said, brother Rashad, you invaded my city. What was I supposed to do? And they roared with laughter. And what I learned from that is that not only are people able to overcome such profound violence, that actually there's an elation that comes and a power that comes with that. And that when people are willing and have the courage to be able to do that, to collaborate, and they can drive that into society, can have an effect on, on folks widely. Um, and so that's the next phase, really. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, 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 that was definitely worth sharing. <laughs> I appreciate that story. Um, there's an audience question here about polarization in the United States. And I think many of us on this call are based in the United States. I know not everybody, but I, I hope this will be of interest to, to everyone who's listening. Um, you know, the polarization that we're seeing in the United States is at extreme levels. Um, and so the question is, what guidance would you offer our donors and partners joining us for this conversation as we seek to find common ground within our families and communities? Um, Adrian, any thoughts on on how we go about this? Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is that this work starts at a personal level. So regardless of what you see or what we've told you today about what's happening around the world, um, it's a practice and it only really becomes more clear as you practice it yourself. I was thinking about you know, sometimes I think about the way that we see 
activism. Uh, you know, we see politics, we see, um, even we see discussions about peace negotiations or other things. So we have models for it in some way, even if they're very complex, we have models for that. And I think this type of work also because it often happens behind closed doors because it works with people who don't necessarily always hold those same sort of power, you know, powerful positions or visible positions. We don't have as many clear models for it. And so the best thing we can start with is to practice, um, which sounds simple, but I assure you every single person at Search for Common Ground practices. <laughs> um, this is not something that, you know, where we come in saying it's easy. Um, and we have a lot of really complex discussions about what is the right way to do this? What is the right way to show up? What is the right way? And without practice within your own family or within your own community, it sometimes doesn't become clear. So I think, you know, starting there, um, starting to think about who's that one person that maybe I could try to have this discussion with and try to understand not just what their position is, but why is it there, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, um, and examine examine the power dynamics of being open to that, examine, you know, what it might take for them to be open to you or you to be open to them, vice versa. Examine what it takes to actually perhaps give up a bit of your own power in doing so and how you protect your own dignity in doing so. Um, that's essentially what's happening all around the world. Um, and it's not just happening at search, it's happening in, in all kinds of places. So I think that is one piece. The other piece that, um, I often think about is that the work we do and the process we take, what it forces us to do is to take a stand on something. And so when you're looking out at, when you're looking at people talk in, in the US right now or in, or in any setting, um, if you don't know what a person stands for, but you know who they stand for, this is probably a problem. <laughs> So um, if you can identify very clearly who someone stands for, but you don't know exactly what their principles are or you, or the, you find that their principles change, this is a sign of, of, of a kind of question you can start to ask. It's a, it's something that it's a way that you can start to engage. Um, and then last, I would say uh, is is getting involved. One of the things I notice in the U.S., and I actually think is true, again, true all over the world, is that we, I don't want to say we give up our power, because I also think power is taken from us in so many different But we fail to recognize some of the power that we do have. Um, we talk about elections. This year, elections are happening around the world uh, more than ever in history. <laughs> and um, Everyone is talking about the presidential election. How many of us are talking about who's gonna be the mayor? How many of us are talking about who's gonna be our state representative? Um, I have a, I live in South Carolina. My, one of the state representatives um, that I know is just incredible in the way he communicates and works with the community and serves them and gives them information and is fighting disinformation. And he's on the opposite side of the political spectrum from me. So how do we pay attention to that? And again, it's a what, not who. Um, so I think understanding, you know, identifying, set a goal for yourself, one thing where you want to be involved this year, and you want to know what people stand for and not who, and you want to help that guide your decision making, and maybe you want to bring, bring that family member you were practicing with to that conversation, that's kind of a, a way to open the door, I think, um, before, you know, getting into the rest of it. Absolutely. I, I mean, I wish we had all the time in the world to continue drawing from these lessons, but what I'm going to take away is, you know, really putting myself in the posture of a peace builder um, and you, you shared that so beautifully, but also the bias for action piece, which is present in, in all of the teams and all of the countries where we do this work. Um, okay. So you should see as an audience member, you should see two links uh, that point you to what we uh, just shared about the peace impact framework outcomes. I know there's been some questions in the chat related to, okay, but how do you measure agency or what does that actually look like? Um, those two links, both are, are pretty 
um, substantial and, and have quite a lot uh, to share about uh, you know, how we get into the, the actual analysis and measurable outcomes. But I am going to go ahead and start closing down our conversation as, as sad as I am. Um, I wanna express my heartfelt gratitude to both Michael and Adrian for sharing their insights and, and valuable experiences with us. Uh, we've taken a deep dive into the world of peace building. I think I, I can speak for, for many of us saying I am walking away with an expanded sense of what it means to find common ground, not just globally, but with some initiative to do so in my own community and with my family as well. And I really want to thank everyone who's in the audience today. Quite a lot of people here. Um, thank you to our donors and our partners. All of you are so valuable and important. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to join us. As you heard today, peace building takes time, courage, audacity, and it also takes collaboration. And that co collaboration is exactly what you're doing today. It involves communities that are facing conflict and it involves all of us, um, a community of people who are willing to invest in this work and invest our time and our resources because we know that it's making a difference. Thank you so much for being a part of that change. If you'd like to invest in peace building today and ensure that our teams can continue supporting communities around the world to find common ground and resolve conflicts without violence, there's a website that you can get to by click, uh, following the QR code that you see on the screen. Your partnership is incredibly critical to everything that we do. And as a small way to say thank you for sharing the time with us, we also wanna offer you a discount in our Love Anyway shop, which you'll get a link for, and this code, you'll just use this code PEACE101, you'll get 20% off any purchase in October, and uh, that all of the proceeds from this shop contribute directly to our peace building work around the world. Finally, I want to share with you a beautiful opportunity. So this is a bias for action piece. This is something you can do in your community. Um, to find common ground. This November, in the midst of a contentious and divisive election season for those of us in the United States, our team is coming alongside partners to host Love Anyway Feasts. So if you're interested in attending a Love Anyway Feast in your community or hosting one, um, there is more information provided in the link in the chat box. Um, we really would love to see people come together around a shared table to bridge divides and to break barriers. So this is a way that you can actually practice um, this posture in, 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 in an act, active way in your community. So friends, thank you so much. It's been an honor to share this time with you. Once again, thank you to Michael and Adrian. Really grateful for you and for everyone in the audience. So we send you off with peace and, and a lot of gratitude. Thank you so much. Okay. Great, we're here. We're here. All right, so first question uh, was, tell us another story, Michael. So do um, you have another one up your sleeve? Sure, I have plenty of stories, but I'll tell another one from Nepal, um, which was uh, connected to that whole campaign that I described earlier uh, about the, the reintegration of, of ex-child soldiers. So at the end of the war, there was a ceasefire. And so a lot of soldiers were basically still they were they were they went to, to bases to camps um and there were all these kids you know in these camps and not sure what to do uh and we decided together with unicef and others that we really wanted to encourage those kids to go home and and equip them to go home and so we uh we did a we had a radio soap opera drama that we were running and we integrated some stories about child soldiers and then we actually recorded a cassette tape of a particular story about a child soldier going home that we uh, that we actually distributed outside of those military bases for for where the rebels had had were, were couldn't um, The storyline was was kind of a powerful one in the drama, where um, one of the, the the main characters, his name was Karga, uh, was trying to decide whether to go home or not, and somebody got uh, a recording of his mother's voice that they she they brought to him and played to him saying, you know, Karga, you're welcome to come home. Uh, I would really love for you to be here no matter what you had done. And then the character decides to come home. And this was an evidence-based thing. This is what, you know, uh, organizations, child protection groups that do reintegration of ex-child soldiers and family reunification will do this sometimes to really encourage kids to come back. And, and there's evidence that shows the mother's voice has a particularly powerful effect on the decision-making that kids might have, as you can obviously all imagine. And so we played this drama, we got it into the camps, we distributed it as widely as we could. And one day 
uh, I was in a in a community, and we were meeting with a youth led group uh, in a place in the southwest of the country called Kailali, and we were met, meeting with this group of youth leaders who had been working with us, uh, doing all kinds of programming, mediation programming, reintegration programming, all kinds of really powerful stuff, in a deeply war affected community, and a young man uh, stood up and he said, you know, I just wanted to tell you that when I was, you know, 13 or 14, I was recruited by the Maoists. Uh, the way he put it was, when I was with the Maoists, we resolved conflict. Mm -hmm. um, but he was, you know, he was a soldier and he had fought in the war for several years. He said, then, you know, I, I was sitting there at the end of the war, the ceasefire came, I didn't know what to do. And then I heard your, your drama and I thought to myself, uh, if Karga could go home, I could go home. And he put down his weapons and he went back to his community uh, and he connected up with his youth leaders and ended up uh, actually getting trained in mediation, managing land disputes, doing campaigning, you know, for voter registration drives when, when the first post-war elections came. And all of this to say, you know, I, I talked about how you can create a glancing blow on somebody's life. Sometimes that's all it takes. It's like a single moment where you're unleashing it in them unleashing in them their own desire to live their best life and to be their best self. So that's another story. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting. I mean, I'm just thinking, thinking um, listening to you talk about the number of people I've talked to you about. You know, I remember in Burundi working with people um, who fought in the war as young men, 16, you know, children, <laughs> adolescents, uh, 16, 15, 17, and asking them, well, how, you know, how was it when you got there? Like, what happened when you got there? Mm. And they're like, oh, it's terrible. We just wanted to go home. <laughs> and yet there kind of becomes this like no way out, right? You sort of sometimes feel that you've made one one step too many and you can't come back and it's it's really interesting to see the work that 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 search has done you know in nepal and nigeria uh yeah in nigeria and many other places kind of trying to create that that path back for those who want it yeah we reached thousands i mean we we were integral part of a, of a major program for former boko haram fighters mm -hmm. both in nigeria and in niger yeah, uh, and you know, and enabling them and equipping them to come home, and to be able to re restart their lives. And so, you know, that st story of that one young guy uh, is actually the story of many, many thousands of people uh, who we've been able to reach all over the world doing this. Um. So the next question uh, is, you know, with searches welcome emphasis on involving youth from Vivian. Uh, with Search's emphasis on involving youth, how would you approach the Haiti situation with the major factor of Kenyan troops and young kids now joining gangs because they're hungry? How do we deal with some of these really complex issues? I mean, I, I don't want to pretend to know a lot about, about Haiti, and we don't have a presence there, So, but I can talk a little bit about how I would get started if we really wanted to create roots in a conflict like that. So one thing I've seen is that almost every place that I've worked, uh, when there's profound violence and instability, like what is being experienced in Haiti now, both in the current crisis, but it's been, you know, it's been prolonged actually as a, as a conflict. Um, but in all every context, young people organize. They they create responses to what's happening around them. You know, the first thing we always recognize is that most young people are not actually being getting involved in violence. Most young people are actually trying to find ways to live their best lives, to thrive, survive, earn a living, those who are lucky to get education. And very often youth organize and create different kinds of structures and ways that they, you know, youth groups, networks, clubs, and, you know, and not just young people, you know, society overall, when there's a breakdown of the institutions that serve them, people organize to try to replace those, they need them. Um, and so there's all kinds of groups. And so that would be the starting point to really figure out who are those youth-led organizations and groups and networks? Who are those women's-led youth, women's-led organizations and networks, other kinds of civil society groups, businesses who are trying to create that fabric and create really powerful, positive responses and start by figuring out, 
you know, who needs support? Who needs to be de-isolated? Who would really be, you know, benefit very powerfully? And then start to build up relationships and connections and create some kind of channels of support to those groups uh, and then go from there. Um, but as we build out our network and, and really build build out from there. What, what do you think? Um, well, yeah, I, it's, it's interesting. It's a very complex case. Um, and, you know, sometimes I, I always like wish, I, this is like a, a wish of mine, my mother's Haitian. So I always kind of wish that we were there in a way. And yet um, I also think it it's important to, um, to know something really well before you get into it. So I'm not gonna lay out my, you know, my five step plan or anything like that, but I do think there's a few things um, to consider. One, exactly what you said, and there are movements in Haiti that I find really interesting that often get sort of overshadowed in the conversation because we're always talking about gang violence or the most recent crisis or the most you know recent political crisis in Haiti. And so there's very little space or very little knowledge to, to most people out there about some of the, the other questions and other, other things that people are engaging in around, you know, food production in Haiti, around um, rights to access to resources, around deforestation, around um, immigration issues and all kinds of things that that uh, there are actually like a lot of groups and and people who are 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 fighting for those things, um, in really productive and interesting ways. There are really powerful social movements that that just don't get a lot of the the attention. So I I really agree with you on that side. Like really looking at you know who who's doing that work already, and a lot of those things are led by young people. Um, so I love you know being able to follow some of those people on Instagram and things like that. And I think. You know, I think um, it's important. It's really important to kind of keep in mind that that does exist alongside everything else going on. There's two other things that I would keep in mind. Um, uh, we have done, you know, we've done work with gangs and similar types of um, violent dynamics where gangs control parts of a city. And I remember. Uh, doing some of this work in CAR a, a few years ago, where you basically like couldn't cross into parts of, you know, one part of a city, depending on who you were affili affiliated with. Um, and- Central the, African Republic. Oh, sorry, yeah. Central African Republic, yes. And, and, and what was really interesting um, is they actually dove into that. <laughs> so they dove into, you know, this dynamic, they worked with religious leaders um, that the gangs were sort of tied to. Um, they worked with members of those gangs and actually created almost like a like peace agreements, not official ones, right? But these kind of agreements between groups. They, um, in order to open up certain, open up certain possibilities, in order to model something that could be possible long term. Um, and it was actually really incredible. They had, you know, they they had these groups kind of like marching through the city together at some point in, in almost like unprecedented way. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, again, like find like positive disruption, finding something that stops that cycle, um, even if just for a moment to show that something else is possible. And it actually was really, really important. Um, and, and it's fascinating because our team doesn't quite do that work anymore. It's like there are other challenges, um, but they're actually moving and building past that mark. And that's something I, I think is really important to keep in mind in Haiti is that this is not, you know, something that will never um, get out of just because it's impossible. And um, there, are, there are ways to, to build past that or to build small pieces of you know, small small bits of progress into the into a next phase, um, and then last is that that sort of external part that Vivian talked about. You know, the the UN, um, the the mission coming in and what that means, um, and I think you know one of the one of the approaches that we've taken, uh, not 
not just in Central African Republic, but in many countries, is to also be a partner to those efforts, um, noting that they can they can hold a certain space, but they can also be you know detrimental to confidence in a lot of the institutions that people need to start building confidence in to really move forward. Um, there they can also be sometimes. Um, not knowledgeable about certain local conflict dynamics. Um, and we've done you know, huge amounts of work advising groups on how to do humanitarian or peacekeeping assistance that, that doesn't exacerbate conflict dynamics. Um, sometimes that's as simple as speaking a language <laughs> that, you know, that people don't realize how political it is, their presence and the way that they're coming in um, or, or how it'll be interpreted. So, I think there's, you know, a, a wide variety of approaches. Um, again, I'm also not <laughs> like an expert on on this, but I have, yeah, I've, I've got some some things I'd love to see change in Haiti, and it's it's really interesting um, to think about what we might do. And what I can say is, we do have a toolbox. And thinking about this sort of intra in yeah internal dynamics of different groups the dynamics between them and then the way external dynamics also you know it gives you almost like a way to look at <laughs> um different approaches you could take at each level so we have a question here additionally which is what is your strategy when people from communities are willing to initiate peace but the root of the conflict is something integral to their life livelihood like land or other resources and you know that that's certainly applicable in Haiti and, and almost every place that we work, in fact. Yeah, so uh, this makes me think a little bit about South Sudan on the surface. There are a lot of places where this is true. Uh, it also makes me think of Burundi around land. Um, land is so tied to livelihood in Burundi. Um, and And, so there are a couple of ways that we deal with this. Uh, one is that when you see this breakdown over resources, part of it oftentimes, and the, you know, the, you have to ask the question, why does it then resort to violence? Like what is that, what is that moment where we go from resource scarcity to violence over resources and what is causing that? And what you'll see in a lot of places um, is that there's a very low level of trust in institutions to help people solve these issues. Um, and when that trust is a certain level of low, people feel there is no other option than to do something by force. So in South Sudan, uh, cattle raiding, you know, very much while it while it has been linked to just kind of resource scarcity in general it's it is i think any expert on that situation would agree that the level at which violence is happening these days is political and it is uh, very much linked to the ability of um of any you know kind of institution to help people uh, solve these issues in other ways and linked to sometimes oftentimes an interest in exacerbating those conflicts through violence um you know by by you know, like in, ensuring or um or uh what's the word i'm looking for not ensuring helping you know um encouraging sorry that's the word i'm looking for but encouraging people to almost solve these things through violence because it creates little proxy you know the right. uh conflicts that that then help them with their overall goals so i think that's an important thing to just keep in mind about these resource related conflicts is it's, it's very rarely are they just about the resources uh, and, and only about the resources and completely spontaneous and not designed in any other way? Um, there's, a lot, there's oftentimes a group of people behind it that are putting a lot of resources and effort to keep those conflicts going because they serve another purpose. Um, and helping people deal with that, deal with that piece, giving them other avenues to solve conflicts, um, supporting you know, people who uh, can serve as mediators and in, in communities and at local levels, 
that often actually helps quite a bit deal with that sort of resource nece like necessity related conflict that we think of. Um, so that's just one thing that pops in my mind, but we do a lot of work, I feel, on, you know, on security sector and on justice reform. That's really about that, right? Like resetting those expect expectations between people and the institutions that are supposed to be serving them. And often there's a mismatch um, that's really exacerbating violence. And also young people and elders, sometimes in communities who, you know, might make decisions and then young people execute those decisions without necessarily having a lot of say. Um, so it's like the resources are there, but not necessarily, it's, it's not only about those things. And it's important to kind of understand that we all have resources that we need to live, but when does that, you know, when does that flip into needing to kill other people or needing to commit violence against another group? I think that's, it's a little bit different. It's not, um, it's not just a natural choice most of the time. I think that very often uh, the, the fact of a conflict being around some of the core uh, foundations of people's livelihoods also offers us a really powerful opportunity mm -hmm. to convene people and to change the conflict dynamics at the same time as changing their overall economic position. And so sometimes it's, you know, across the Sahel, we've been bringing together farmers uh, and herders, uh, you know, folks who, who are, um, you know, who, who are uh, raising livestock and moving. Um, and there have been a lot of conflicts that has all the dimensions and all the dynamics that you just mentioned, Adrian. And we've been able to bring people together with this core question of how do you actually uh, maximize the natural resources that you have available to you. How do you govern them? How do you resolve disputes over them? But how do you actually create, you know, some level of increased prosperity? Mm. And similarly in Burundi, you know, we worked with, uh, with, uh, with people to actually, and particularly women, to be able to have all the networks that they need to bring their own products to market. Because sometimes people are able to produce, but they don't have a way to sell it. There's all kinds of barriers that that disconnects people from in that context from being able to participate in the economy even the informal economy that have to do with the conflict dynamics and so you know we really create some of those opportunities mm -hmm. um you know cu cultivating entrepreneurship among you know young people and helping to really uh, help people to both envision how they can you know be entrepreneurs and use the resources available to them to create livelihoods uh, but use resources in a way that builds out their networks in whole new ways that build social fabric for the society. And so the, it also is as much a solution to the to the conflict dynamics as it is a challenge. Yeah, it's almost like making resources and in, resources are an interest and resources create a sense of security oftentimes or a sense of insecurity. And so how you understand that if that's you know at the heart of it and engage with that. So we have uh, just last questions here around um, around how we measure change, and you know, and so um, there's a question if you could talk a little bit more about the indicators that we use and also how you measure how we're measuring increased personal agency. Sure. So um, Maritza did share the link to all of the sort of specific indicators we use. I can talk a little bit about this though. We have you can think of it as like three sets of indicators. So one is a set of standard indicators that every team commits to. Um, they're really aligned with some of the, the UN um, sustainable development goals, like things that tend to be used by policymakers and by people working in this space to understand whether things are getting better or worse, <laughs> generally speaking, in terms of conflict. Um, and uh, what we did was we we picked 10 things that felt relevant, right-sized, and feasible to measure for people who do this kind of work. Um, and so uh, with that, we've got, you know, we've got those 10. We have another set that's based on people's lived experiences, and these actually change per context. So for example, uh, in Afghanistan, one of the indicators that came out of that was you know, being able to take my daughter to school and walk along a specific road to get there. 
Um, so this idea is a little different than just do I feel safe walking in the area where I live because there's something about taking my daughter to school and the perhaps act of that being something that represents safety and security um, in this in this specific place and in Afghanistan where we did the research. Um, so we come up with more specific indicators like that that are quite contextual. And then we have a third set which are based on practitioner observations. So when we do this work, you almost have to plan to replan all the time. <laughs> it's like the basic, the basic uh, tenant of this work is that you know everything will change and then it will change again and again. So um, what we've had is a, a set, a process where we actually look at what are the outcomes, expected, unexpected, positive, negative, what happened um, as a result of our work we note those and then we identify things that are coming up as patterns. And so with that, if you could imagine, you'd end up with this really robust set of ways to understand a conflict. And then those five themes that I spoke about in our call today, you know, you can essentially tag each indicator as one of those themes. Um, and so this helps us really understand how is conflict evolving? How's it going? You know, how's it changing uh, and we can track them so in places like sudan they're actually tracking every month you know their set of indicators and looking and producing data that they can share with others on how the conflict is evolving for example um, how, are you measuring, how are you measuring personal agency oh so for personal agency we have two standard measures um and those those are people who take the percent of people who take action about things they care about and the percent of people who believe that they can uh, change something that they care about in their society. And so between these two, we get a sense of do people, you know, do people feel that their actions actually matter? It's really about power. <laughs> do I have power to do something? And then also, do I take that power in my own hands every once in a while or not? Um, and so this is a really interesting one to kind of watch uh, go up and down. But those are the two standards. But then you'll see, you know, in terms of lived experience, you'll often see things like, I believe in Sri Lanka, we had one around women who could be, who could connect with other women in positions of power, <laughs> in, in political mm -hmm. sense. So this kind of a, yeah, uh, uh, you know, very specific um, thing that, that people were saying, oh, that would really mean something to me if I was able to do that, right? Um, and so that's how you, that's how we kind of think about agency from those different perspectives. Fantastic. I think those are the questions that we've got. So this has been super fun. Yeah. Always good to talk to you. Always. <laughs> and to everyone. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, any other questions? And they can let the let the group know. And I'm sure we can meet up again and answer more. <laughs> Anytime. All right. Bye.